So we are going to break bread today, uh, thinking about Second of Kings chapter five. That's the account of Naaman, which we've just read, the commander of the Syrian army, who's got leprosy. But his wife's got a little servant girl from Israel, who says, "Oh, if my master were in Israel, he could get." cured by the prophet Elisha. So he goes off with loads of money and horses and chariots and comes to Elisha. And Elisha doesn't come out to meet him, but just says, go and wash in the Jordan River. It's about 15, 20 miles away. And he goes there, doesn't want to, but he does, dips himself seven times, whoops, and he's, he's cleansed. And he comes back very humble and says, oh yeah, I want to be a worshiper of Yahweh, the one true God, and, and all that uh, sort of stuff. And then he uh, he goes back to Syria, but Elisha's servant Gehazi goes running after him and says, oh, could I, could we just have uh, a talent of silver? I said, oh yeah, take two talents of silver. And Gehazi lies about this and he gets Naaman's leprosy. Right, so all those things, believe it or not, do actually point forward to the things of the Lord Jesus Christ who's, you know, that's who we're here to remember. So we're going to go through everyone's prayer requests. I'm sorry if I don't remember every little, I'll say little, they're all big, but, you know, every big thing that you've all said, but we know that God hears your words as if they are prayers. So let's, uh, let, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you because we love you and we love your son and we love your word and we pray that you will open our eyes to this story of Naaman and Elisha and that we might father be challenged and comforted and through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope certain hope that we shall live forever in your kingdom heavenly father please forgive us our sins please father chase those dark parts of our lives uh, out of us and help us in our struggle to be spiritually minded, which is <clears throat> really what we desire, to have the mind of Christ, to have his spirit, to have your spirit in us. And we pray, Father, that you will give each of us meetings this week with people to whom we can share the gospel. You know how shy we all are. We pray that we might have those meetings and be able to win men and women for Jesus to your glory. We Thank you, Father, for the progress you've given us. We pray for Phil and Miriam in their work with that lady there, and we pray for Candice. And we thank you, her husband just got baptized. We pray you'll be with her in giving birth to her child and bless that child as well. And we pray for Saida as she does her best to spread the gospel where she is. And we pray for Juliet and for her son who's self-harming. And that you will be with Phil and his family with all their issues with cancer at this time. We really pray for your special blessing upon them at this intense time of need for them. And be with me in my mission in Ukraine next week and bless it that it might glorify you. And according to your will and purpose, please keep me safe and bring me back to, to the family and so on. Please bless our church in Croydon in the pub and all our plans that, that we have there. And we pray for Dee and the things that she raised with us, those like Ben waiting for organ donations and for all these issues. And we think of Carol raising with us the issues of asylum seekers, finding it difficult now to, to survive in the UK. We do pray that none of us might be distracted by what we have before us. But that we might not lose our focus upon the fact that your son lived and died for me. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with Arash and give him a quick and positive interview and give him wisdom in the choices that are before him and for all those in Iran suffering from flooding at, at this time. And we pray for those who are being baptized here and there online or in one way or another that you will be with every single one of us in all our issues. And we pray for Ed with that lump on his back. We really pray, Father, it may not be anything too bad and that you will guide him through that and preserve Ed, that he may keep on being such a light 
in the darkness. And we pray that you will bless all his preaching that he does and all the many conversations that he has and that you'll be with his neighbors and help them, Father, to come to you. So please, Father, go with each of us. And again, we pray, please speak to us and open our eyes to your word and teach us your way. For Jesus' sake, amen. Right, we have been through 2 Kings 5, haven't we? we we've uh, just read through it. Um, just to look at the first couple of verses again. Now, Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master. That word with literally means he was a great man waiting on his master. In other words, he had a master, and he was and his master was the king of Syria, and he served him. And he was honorable, because by him Yahweh had given victory to Syria. So this guy is very big, and he was a mighty man of valor. That means he killed lots of Israelites, because Syria was fighting with Israel at this time, but he was a leper. Right, so this guy's a big guy. Right? He's famous, uh, etc., although he's a leper. <clears throat> the Syrians had gone out in companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maiden, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So you see suddenly a big contrast. This male, who is very powerful, is in with the in crowd, and this anonymous woman, the girl, who had been just taken into captivity. And she's a slave girl. And of course, the way it all works out is that the anonymous girl, who is a, a nobody and a slave, ends up saving a great powerful man. And you see that they are actually presented in par parallel. You see, it says in verse two that she waited on Naaman's wife. And although this is not clear in the English, it is definitely there in the Hebrew in verse one, that Naaman was a great man with his master, was a great man who waited on his master. So they've, they've both got a master whom they serve. And of course, when Naaman dips himself in water and he's cleansed, his skin becomes like the the, the flesh of a young child, which is the very same term used there in verse 2, a little maiden, a young girl. So you see, he actually becomes like her. And this is how it is. God works with obscure people. And that is one theme of the whole Elisha story. But he works, God works with obscure people through this anonymous slave girl, who's in captivity. I think of the other, another story of the guy who goes out and with, it, with his axe and cuts down trees and the axe head flies off and lands plop in the, in the, in the river. Oh, his hang it was borrowed. You know, and Elisha makes the axe head swim. And then there's the, the widow woman who's in badly in debt and her husband's dead and the creditor wants to take her two kids as slaves. All these obscure little people are used by God in the bigger narrative. And this is the comfort to all of us who may think that I am totally obscure. And yes, you are. But the, the thing is, God uses us. That, that is the point. So <clears throat> this man, this Naaman, is, has been leading, really, the campaign against Israel. This slave girl, this Hebrew girl, we are told that she was taken into captivity by the companies of the Syrians, verse 2. And she had been uh, taken captive out of the land of Israel as a little girl. Well, you can be sure, pretty sure, that that means that the Syrians had killed her family. They had killed her older brothers, her parents, grandparents, probably burnt her little village house to the ground. And you can, I'm afraid, be fairly sure they, on the way to uh, back to Syria, that she would have been sexually abused. That is how it goes. It's how it goes today. And it certainly would have been how it went back, back then. And yet she has this faith, this faith in the God of Israel. But whatever the basis of that faith, it would have been pretty slender. 
even if her parents had been strong believers, well, they wouldn't have had that many years to teach her because she was taken away as a little girl and she had no teacher, she had no priest or whatever there in Syria. And she would have grown up, of course, naturally speaking, hating the Syrians. And Naaman would have been to her uh, the absolute epitome of the Syrian military. The guys that probably raped her, that, that, that killed her family, etc. And he is the boss of them. And yet, despite that very simple level of knowledge that she has, she comes to grace. And she wants him to be cured. And she believes that if only he can go to Elisha back in Israel, in Samaria, he will be cured of leprosy. But she says that by faith. Because in Luke 4.27, the Lord says that there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha, but none of them were cured. So it's not as if this girl had seen <laughs> loads of lepers getting cured by Elisha. She hadn't seen that because Elisha didn't cure any lepers. The Lord Jesus tells us that. But she believed that it could happen. So you see, she has this faith, absolutely. And we're going to talk later about what level of knowledge Naaman had, but that was like, likewise, it seems to me, not that great. So you can see that somebody who has a very limited knowledge picked up in her case in very early childhood, can still believe, can still actually have that faith growing to the point that she understands my God of Israel is a God of grace. And I will show that grace to my mistress's husband, the awful, terrible Naaman, the head of the army. Now, I think you see there that, you know, in terms of doctrinal knowledge, what did she have? Very little. And as I say, with Naaman himself, what did he know? Well, it seems virtually nothing. I mean, he comes to Elisha saying, oh, well, I expected that he would uh, call on the name of Yahweh, his God. And if I gave him enough money, uh, he would cure me. Well, but he just tells me to go and, uh, go and dip in the River Jordan. So what did he know? And he comes back to Elisha and says, wow, the God of Israel is going to be my God. And we are left with the impression that Naaman and the little girl, who up, of course, to be a, a woman, uh, will be in God's kingdom. I mean, the Lord Jesus seems to imply this about Naaman when he says, you know, there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha. None of them were cured, just Naaman, who was a Gentile. So we're going to meet these people in the kingdom of God. But on what basis? So doctrinally or theologically or in terms of knowledge, did they make their, their commitment to God? Well, not very much. I mean, what we would like to read is that uh, this little girl was uh, the daughter of one of the sons of the prophets and had been raised in the Hebrew scriptures. And secretly, her and her mistress's husband, that is Naaman, had secret Bible studies together and they went through the scrolls together. And they, he had a very accurate knowledge of the way of the God of Israel. So he trooped off to Elisha and got, got cured. Uh, but that's not the case. If that were the case, the record would say that. But all the time you get the impression these people actually didn't have much of a basis of knowledge. Why I'm laboring this is that there is a hole in every human heart that only the true God and the Lord Jesus now can fill. And so we all have that and everybody whom you encounter has that and i think what god is looking for is movement from that admission that i've got this hole in my heart to commitment the other thing you get from from naaman is his progressive humility he listens to the voice of his wife who would have said, well, the Hebrew servant girl said this, this is a little girl who was taken out of uh, Syria by your guys, Naaman. Um, yeah. Okay, so he listens to the voice of his wife and he listens to the voice of his wife's servant girl. 
And if you go on, you see um, in verse four, someone went in and told his Lord, another slave said, the girl is from the land of Israel said this. So you see all the time, he's showing humility in listening to others. Well, of course, when he gets to Elisha, Elisha says to him, well, Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He says, hey, go and dip yourself in the Jordan. He says, no, I'm not going to dip myself in that muddy little stream, which at times is all that River Jordan is. If you look at the baptisms done last week in the River Jordan, uh, you'll see that river you can see in the video from one side to the other. I mean, it is really not very big. And he says, well, aren't Abana and far part of the rivers of Damascus far better? Huh. And he goes away in a huff. But his servants come to him and say, why don't you just do this? And he does. So you see, he's progressively being humbled and he has to dip himself in the river Jordan. Now, what does Jordan mean? Jordan literally means that which brings down. That which brings down, because, you know, it starts up in the north of Israel and it flows down to the Dead Sea, the lowest uh, you know, spot well below sea level. So Jordan means that which brings down. And he has to dip in that which brings down. And then he comes back to Elisha, all humble, and he, his skin is turned into the skin of a little child. And he comes back humbled and, oh, what can I give you? No, no, you can't give me anything. Or let me just take two donkeys worth of uh, soil with me and I'll make an altar on which to sacrifice to the God of Israel back in Syria. Well, God again had said that that's how altars should be built. You remember he said, ideally, he wanted an altar built of earth, of dust, because that is all we are. He didn't want it made beautiful. He didn't want it with cut stones, but with raw stones just kicked together. The teaching, of course, that he, he just wants us, on the basis of our humanity being dust, to offer to him on that basis without the razzmatazz of religion and so forth. And so Elisha uh, presumably had told Naaman about that, but whatever, Naaman accepts that, and he takes those two donkeys worth of soil with him back to, back to Syria to make that altar on which to sacrifice quietly on his own uh, to God. Now, of course, a great man never offered sacrifice himself. He got his priests to do it, the guys who did his religious stuff. Uh, but he, no, he, he says, well, I'm going to do it myself. I'm just going to tip out this bit of soil myself. And uh, yeah, I'll offer animals on top of it um, to the God of Israel. It's a big step down, a big step down for him. He's really come down a long way. And I'm afraid so many people don't come to Jesus because they are proud. And you see in him a man who is, despite kicking and screaming against it, is progressively brought down. And when Gehazi runs to him after he started his journey back home and says, oh, oh we've got a bit of a problem, it, we're told that he personally comes down from his chariot to talk to him. And in a sense, that is what our relationship with God is about, being progressively brought down. This is why Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So you've got to come down that you might be lifted up. Now, you live that out in baptism. Uh, uh, when you do it, you go under the water, you come up out again. But actually, that process is going on all our lives in every way. We are being brought down that we might be raised up. So that is actually why God has structured human experience so that as you get older, as you get closer to your death, you do lose your faculties. You do lose your physical strength, your mental ability. You do start to lose it all. Because really, that's his plan to humble you so that at the point you die, you are at sort of, I was going to say peak humility, but you know what I mean? You are down there 
so that you might be lifted up in resurrection to glory when the Lord comes. So in a sense, it's a race to the bottom. Do not be surprised that things happen in your life in order to bring you down. Do not be surprised if, for example, you are a very good plumber, but you go and make a stupid mistake. You, I was going to say, you might be a dentist, but that's a bit painful to imagine that. Um, you, you might be a very good whatever it might be, but you make an uncharacteristic mistake. You may be a very careful driver, but you uh, go and drive in a bus lane for some reason, oh, and you get caught on camera. Whatever it might be, this is why it happens to bring us down. And once you get that idea, then you you see it. Yeah, I'm being progressively brought down, and I should be brought down to the grave at the end of it all. And yeah, that's why things go wrong. I'm not saying it's why you sin, but I think it is also why God allows the whole concept of sin because you are shamed by your sin, either in your own mind or before other people. Are your failures, what you should have done, what you ought to have done, etc. Yeah, all this is all part of this process to bring you down so that you might be lifted up in due time, as Peter says. And you see this very clearly here with, um, with Naaman. Absolutely, very clearly. And he, he has this humility. Uh, and Although you know, he kicks and you know, doesn't like it to, to have to wash in the River Jordan, uh, yeah, okay, he does this. And yes, he is cured. Well, just uh, going back to uh, how the, the story goes on, he takes with him, um, verse 5, a huge amount of money. He takes with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of clothing. Well, fairly recently in Israel's history, the hill of Samaria had been sold for two talents of silver. So the whole of Samaria was worth two talents of silver, and he, he could have bought it with this 10 talents of silver. He could have bought that five times over. So he goes into this whole thing in a very sort of human religious yeah. he's got all this wealth he's got all this power and he thinks that if you've got wealth and power then you can do what you want and you can get your religious side dealt with it's a bit like sinning and going to the catholic church with all your money to buy forgiveness for it with an indulgence well we know that doesn't work but Okay, he, he goes off with his massive wealth. And he goes to the king of Israel, not to Elisha, because I guess he assumed that the king of a country um, must be responsible for his prophet. <coughs> well, he gets to the king, and the king of Israel, verse 7, says, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends to me to heal a man of leprosy? He just wants an argument with me. This king of Israel, his lack of faith, contrasts absolutely with the faith of the slave girl. She says, oh, I know that if this uh, Naaman goes to Elisha in Samaria, definitely he could cure him of his leprosy. And he's saying, huh, you know, well, maybe God could do this, but there's nobody on earth who could do this. The king of Israel comes over as simply not believing. He doesn't even think to ask Elisha, although he knows Elisha, he doesn't even think to ask Elisha to try to cure Naaman. So his faith is zero. And again, you see the contrast of the weak and the strong. It's quite a theme in the Bible. But also imagine how Naaman felt. He's come with all this money, these millions, if not billions of wealth, with a whole bunch of guys to protect it. An officer to the king of Israel who, who just goes into a flap and says, oh, you, you, you're just picking a fight, aren't you? Of course I can't heal you, duh. What are you coming to me for? And you wonder why this happened. It was a sort of a rebuff. There he was, full of hope that, oh, yeah, I'm going to come and get healed. No, 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 no. Of course I can't. What are you talking about? Well, <clears throat> Elisha then steps in, doesn't he? And you 
you know, whatever Elisha's motives are, well, we can talk about that, but uh, whatever. Well, he goes to Elisha. So Naaman, verse 9, came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now, don't forget, the Syrians are Israel's enemies, and it is their companies who have carried away captive girls like Naaman's wife's servant girl. And now the general of the Syrian army, with all his horses and chariots and his company, uh, stands there in front of Elisha's sort of front door. And Elisha comes over as very calm. He doesn't even open the door. He just sends a messenger and says, oh, yeah, what do you want? I'm going to get cured of leprosy. Yeah, go 15, 20 miles down the road, dip yourself, or wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and you'll be good. I'm not talking to you. Uh, he comes over as very confident. There's horses and chariots outside his front door, and the doorbell's ringing, as it were. Why, why is he so calm? Well, of course, he had seen God's horses and chariots whoosh Eli Elijah away. And in chapter 6, which may well chronologically be before chapter 5, but that's another story, Elisha prays that the eyes of his servant will be open so that he might see the horses and chariots of angels that are all around him. When the servant says, oh, wow, there's horses and chariots all uh, around us of the Syrians, Elisha says, I don't worry about that. Oh, God, can you help this guy open his eyes so that he sees your horses and chariots? So Elisha is a man who really feels the presence of the angels, even if he can't see them. Oh, wow, there's horses and chariots of the enemy outside my front door. Oh, why would I be phased by that? I've got horses and chariots of angels around me. Now, <laughs> I'm sure we've all had some sort of experience at different times in our lives of where somebody has appeared in our life and saved us. And later we think, well, was that an angel? I certainly have had this a number of times. But I think that you know, the, the art of the spiritual life is, you know, to have the faith that sees what is invisible. And this is so that, talk about man is not alone. We are surrounded by this huge system of God through his angels. This is the whole point of the vision of the cherubim in Ezekiel 1. There they were sitting there by the rivers of Babylon, uh, you know, weeping and all the rest of it, that our God forgotten, has forgotten us and what's the point in life? Well, by the rivers of Babylon, he sees this huge system of horses, chariots, cherubim. Too wonderful to explain in words, but he sees it. And that was the point. You are not alone. Even in your sin, even in your exile from me, I am with you in a wonderful way. Now, Elisha got this so that when the horses and chariots Come around him and ding dong there's a knock on the door and it's Naaman the general of Syria oh really he's totally unfazed and he does not even open the door oh yes sir you know what can we do for you sir none of that oh you want to get cured of leprosy yeah well uh, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times on the door shuts but you wonder why he was like that. I mean, some people say, oh, well, he didn't want to be involved with a with an unclean leper. Well, I don't particularly go for that one. I think he's doing a distance healing. And he wants this miracle to happen with him not present for Naaman's benefit. We saw last week, 2 Kings 4, that when the widow woman comes to Elisha and says, look, the creditors come to take away my sons, I have no money to pay him. He says, okay, go and borrow lots of vessels. You've got a bit of oil at home. Go borrow those vessels, go home, shut the door on you and your two sons and pour out the oil into the vessels and then sell it and you'll be good. And that's what happens. She shut the door on her and her two sons, began to pour the oil, and whoa, well, it kept pouring into all these vessels. So you see the intention there that Elisha, the man of God, would not be physically present. He would not be present. We go to a lot of Pentecostal churches, oh, talk about, oh, the man of God. 
you know, the pastor, a man of God, must be present to do the miracle. Oh. See, Elisha is very careful to do it the other way around. You shut the door on you, have your personal relationship with God, I'm outside the door, and you experience God for yourself. And I think that's the same in essence what he does with Naaman. Oh, you want to be cured? You, want, right, you expect me to appear before you and to say abracadabra, big fuss, big razzmatazz. Oh, you are cured. No, it's not like that. Oh, I'll keep your money. I don't want your money. Uh, you go 15, 20 miles down to the Jordan and dip yourself, uh, wash yourself seven times and you get clean. He doesn't even say, oh, and do come back and see me afterwards. He doesn't even say that. So. That's it. And he does that because he wants Naaman to experience God personally. And ultimately, all our real experience of God is outside of any religious structure. Going to church is what I think you do to help other people. And yes, to receive teaching uh, to, to some degree. But that is not where alone you meet God. It has got to be a personal connection with God and with the Lord Jesus. And all the way through, this is being taught. You wonder why he says, go and wash seven times in Jordan and your flesh will be restored. Why did he say just go and wash once? Well, it's the old question, why isn't prayer answered immediately? You remember Jericho had to be circled six days and then they got victory on the seventh day. The child we saw getting resurrected um, in 2 Kings 4 sneezed seven times before coming back to life. Elijah, when he's at the top of Carmel, prays for rain. He prays once. He says to his servant, go and see if a cloud's coming with rain in it. No. Prays again. Go and see. No. Third time. Go and see. No. He keeps doing that six times. And, and the servant keeps coming back and says, no, there's no, there's no rain coming. But the seventh time he prays, he comes. So why is this? Well, again, it is because contrary to how Naaman saw it, contrary to how religious people tend to see things, God is not an ATM. God is not a bank machine. You do not just wave a card in front of it and tap in a four-digit code and out comes your bank notes. I mean, this is not how it is with God. Why is healing, when it happens, not immediate? Well, Ed's worried about a, a lump in his back. Well, why, <laughs> when he noticed it, why didn't he just go to the doctor, pray about it, and, uh, oh, yeah, then it, straight away, yeah, 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 you, you go to the uh, hospital the very same day, get an instant analysis, and, oh, you're good. Oh, praise the Lord. Why is it all so spun out? I don't know, you've got to come on Thursday, and I expect they'll say, and you've got to wait, sir, such and such a period to get your results. And then there might be some treatment and all this. Why is, it all, why is life so long drawn out for crying out loud? Well, yeah, here it is. Because God thirsts for relationship with us. That's why things are long drawn out. That's why prayer often is not answered immediately. I mean, some prayers are answered immediately, but others are not um, immediately and it is to make this connection between us and God so that you enter into dialogue with him well just a little detail go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean now clean this is the language of ritual cleanliness now there is in Leviticus 14 that the whole stuff about how you get uh, cleansed of leprosy and what you should do when you're cleansed. You have got to wash, dip yourself, etc., and then you are pronounced ritually clean. There's two stages. There's getting cured of your leprosy, as he says here, go and wash and your flesh will be restored, and you shall be clean. So I think the and you shall be clean is telling him or hinting to him perhaps that then you are ready for service before God. Now we'll come back to that. Naaman's angry. Verse 11, he said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call the name of Yahweh his God, wave his hand over the place. He wanted the razzmatazz of like a Pentecostal style healing and he doesn't get it and he's angry. 
Well, why do people get angry? Well, I think it's because of hurt pride. I think anger and hurt pride always go together. You, you read about people being sent on anger management courses because, I don't know, they whacked somebody or they stepped out of line. Oh, he's got to go on an anger management course. Well, yes, but the real answer to anger management is humility, actually, because anger comes from her pride. And that's what you see with, with Naaman. I got all my wealth. I've got, I want to have a high profile curing and healing. Oh, no, I'm not going to get it. Just quietly go down to a muddy stream and, and uh, wash yourself in, in, a, in a muddy stream. Yes, yes, and that'll be it. And the door shuts. Don't even come back and tell me about it. I know it's going to happen if that's what you do. Goodbye, I have to be getting on. So you see, all the time, God is trying to humble him, not because God is mean, but to be, to, to help people to come down, that he might lift them up. So verse 14, he does listen to his servants to say, go on, go on, do it. Then when he down, and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. So it is progressive humility. The way you do wonder at the way it says he dipped himself in the Jordan, he's actually told in verse 11 uh, to wash himself seven times. Here he just dips himself. You do wonder whether his obedience was complete, but it was still accepted, was it not? <clears throat> well, You wonder why God would do this uh, to the captain of the Syrian army who has absolutely killed so many Israelites. It's rather like, again, in the next chapter, we're going to read how when the Syrian army invades, they are made blind by Elisha, and then they're given food and drink and sent home unharmed, rather than killing them. So you see all the time God's grace in all this and how counterintuitive it is to live the life of grace. Well, he does come back the 15, 20 miles back to Elisha's place after he's been cured and his skin does become like a little child. And he wants to, uh, yeah, he, he he clearly wants to be grateful to God. Um, but if I can just go back to um, the, the flesh becoming like the flesh of a little child, so that's verse 14. Right, he's been dipped. This is baptism, right? This is clearly water baptism, is what he's looking forward to. But he is reborn and becomes as a little child. John 3, a man must be born of water, that is water baptism, and of the Spirit before he can enter the kingdom of God. What happens when you're baptized in water is that you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a very clear teaching. Peter says, and they say, oh, what should we do? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, so that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't believe in speaking in tongues and you know, rabbits out of hats and miracles and all that. That is, that was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the first century. Uh, but what we are given now is the Spirit as in the mind, as in the presence of the Lord Jesus in our lives. And it is that which makes us new. It is the power to become new. Which, of course, as Nicodemus says, well, how can a man do this to himself? Well, no, you can't. Uh, but you can be reborn. You can get a new pair of eyes. You know, Mark was just talking about his mother-in-law, big changes in her. Yeah, absolutely. This is what happens. You can be reborn. It is the, the rebirth of the human person. And this is what everybody desperately needs and wants. And man's need for that is answered in the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is why I would crawl on my knees if necessary, as William Booth said, from you know one side of England to the other, or whatever he said, uh, to bring someone to Christ, to, to baptize someone in water, because I see this radical change that is then made possible for them. 
through the gift of the Spirit. And do not deny this. I mean, Paul says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of us. So this is no small thing. And I would be very leery of any church who tells you that, oh, there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit today. It was all in the first century. You know, shush, shush, don't talk about that. I mean, it, it, this is a denial of actually what Christianity is actually all about in reality. And you see the difference in the lives and the personalities of people who talk like that. Uh, and those who are open to the rebirth of the Spirit. Well, as I say, he, he is reborn, although, as I said, on what basis? On the basis of what? What doctrinal knowledge did he have? Well, not much at all. And he comes back and says, verse 15, I see there is no God in all the earth, but only in Israel. Well, <laughs> yeah, we know what he means, but we'd rather he say, uh, there is no other God but the God of Israel. Well, he doesn't. He still has got the primitive idea that each nation has got their own God and their God lives in their little geographical area. And that's clearly what he thought about Yahweh, that he just lives in Israel. And that's the, uh, that, that was the mistake Jonah made, that, oh, I, I can run, a, run, run, run away from Israel, I run away from God. So, you know, Naaman's understanding is not 100%. But he's clearly set up as a convert. And in fact, when the Lord Jesus cures the centurion's servant, when the centurion says, don't even come to my house, just say the word, the Lord says, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And it's sort of alluding to what Naaman says here. There is no God in all the earth but in Israel. And Jesus says about the centurion, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And the similarities are similar, that they both sort of send uh, to, well, the centurion sends to Jesus saying, please come heal my servant. Uh, and sort of the same uh, happens really with, with, um, with Naaman, uh, please, heal my servant uh, as it were and they're both gentile military men etc <clears throat> but my point is that sure Naaman is accepted by the Lord Jesus I think as a convert but on what basis I mean he had a very shallow level of faith of knowledge by a deep level of faith but a shallow level of knowledge and I think that this would appear to me to make a lot of conversions that we might be a bit leery of, uh, yeah, valid, in the sense that it is a step, it is a step towards the God of Israel. And it doesn't stop there, of course. And he says, verse 17, Let, give me two donkeys burden of earth to be given to your servant, because I won't offer burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to Yahweh. Well, he's clearly made a conscious allegiance, hasn't he, to Yahweh, and he's going to offer this himself in a humble way on two donkeys burdens of, of earth of soil but yes that's very good but he's still got the idea i think uh, that you need some soil from israel he could have made his altar out of soil back in syria from syrian soil but well, no i need to have the soil of israel because yahweh is the god who's in israel he's not quite there is he in his understanding but that doesn't stop his acceptance by God at this point. There's also a lot of evidence that it was quite common to take the, the soil or the dust of another country to your country if you had won a great victory in that country. You see there's inscriptions about what happened when Nineveh was destroyed, Babylon was destroyed, all this kind of stuff, but the victor always took some of the soil back to their city as sign of, you know, and they made some sort of shrine out of it. But what victory had been won in Israel? You see the inversion of the whole thing, that the victory that had been won was the conversion of Naaman. So he's starting to get it, just as the, the cross of Jesus is the, the symbol of shame in the eyes of the world, but it is the symbol of glory in the big inversion. That, that of, of values that happens in 
sort of the spiritual economy where humility and anonymity like the servant girl that becomes great and the, the great the great and mighty like Naaman are brought down and then he says well could you just uh, forgive me this one thing verse 18 then my master goes into the house of women and he leans on my hand and I bow, bow myself in the house of women uh, may Yahweh pardon your servant in this thing well the answer is not a yes or no Elisha is careful not to say, oh, yeah, that's right, mate. Yeah, no, you'll be right. He doesn't say, yeah, you'll be right. That's okay. He says, go in peace. And I think that is hugely significant. On the highest level, what should Naaman have done? He should have gone back and said, look, I'm not going to be the commander of the army anymore. And if you kill me, you kill me. But I'm not bowing down to, to women. And that's it. He doesn't do that. You think of Daniel's friends who, when everyone in Babylon is told to fall down, worship the great image that Nebuchadnezzar has made, they remain standing, and because of that, they are put into the fiery furnace. All right, wonderful heroes of faith. Very good. Well done. My inquiry is, what about all the other Jews there, who I'm sure some of them were believers, who did bow down? What about them? We hear stories of how the Christians in the first century refused to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar in a fairly, you know, just sort of surface level kind of kind of way. All right, and they were thrown to the lions. Okay, very good. What about all the Christians who did burn <clears throat> incense to Caesar, who just said, oh, well, I'm not strong enough to give my life. Um, you sure I will go through this on a surface level? The same way as uh, you hear about um, Albert Merz, uh, a, a young Christadelphian guy in Nazi Germany who refused to join the uh, German military, and he stuck his guns to the end and was executed for refusing to join the German military. Well, good, good on you. God bless you. You have a better resurrection. Uh, what about all the others in his church? same church, even his own family members, who did join the German military and fought. What about them? Oh, you, you don't hear about them. They were there, I'll tell you about them. Over coffee afterwards, because I met a couple of them and heard the story. It's those people I'm more interested in, in a sense, because those people, I'm afraid, are you and me. And here you got another one of us lot, and it is Naaman. Should he have bowed down to women? No, in, a, in the ideal world. But you see, there's levels of response. And oh, he takes a lower level. And he knows he's going to take a lower level. And he says ahead of time, well, can you forgive me in advance? Can Yahweh forgive me in advance for this? And you may say, oh, you, you shouldn't ever do that. You shouldn't say to God, hey, could you just forgive me in advance, but I'm going to do this sin. Oh, that, that's not right. And it's not right. I mean, if you sin, oh, hang, oh, look, God, sorry, please forgive me. Right, that's one thing. But to say, look, God, what I'm going to do is this, and it's a sin, but um, you just forgive me in advance. <laughs> well, the idea is sort of a bit, um, bit not okay, you know, put it mildly. But he's weak, and he's realistic, and he says this. I'm going to sin in advance. Well, what you, what you, is that okay? Or and that's why you see Elisha doesn't say, oh, yeah, that's all right. If he'd have said, yes, that is okay. Well, it would have sort of led all sorts of weak people like you and me into all kinds of weakness and sin. If he'd have said, no, it's not okay, he would have been saying, look, mate, there's only one standard and that's the highest. And if you don't get there, then God's not interested in you. And that's not true either. But he says, go in peace. And peace in the Bible is nearly always peace on, on the basis of forgiveness, of God's mercy and God's forgiveness. All the way through. That is how God, that is what peace means. We now have peace with God, Paul says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We who, because of our sins, were once enemies, have now been 
reconciled to God and we have peace with God. And so this is where, strangely enough, it all does come down and back as it always does to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the blood of Jesus. He says to him, look, go in peace. Yes, you are a sinner. And yeah, you haven't got it quite right. Your understanding is not perfect. Your behavior is not perfect. You recognize that, go in peace. And you see, that is the position we are in. It is simplistic Sunday school Christianity to suggest that, well, yes, you live a good life. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, occasionally you have whoopsie, you sin. Oh, dear God, I'm sorry about that. Okay, yes, you come up again. Go on in your perfect good life. Oh, whoops. Another sin, okay, yes, God forgives you. You say you're sorry, yes, God. Oh, rubbish, that, that, nonsense. That, that, that's not the reality of the lives of any of you here. It's not the reality of my life, nor is it the reality of anybody's life. The point is that we live our whole lives in many aspects and dimensions of them less than perfect. This is what I say when people come to me and say, look, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm a serial whatever. I, I, I'm addicted to porn. I, I get this all the time. People say, but can I be baptized? I say, oh, of course. Oh, but the other churches say, you, you know, I've got to quit this, that, or the other. I say, yeah, sure. So you're going to quit? Well, are you going to quit? Quit your drugs, quit your whatever. And you know what? After that, you'll suddenly realize if you're a spiritual person, oh, hang, what about this weakness of my life? What about that weakness? What about that weakness? And the answer is go in peace. It is not, yes, it's okay to do that. No, you must repent of it. Absolutely. But for now, go in peace. And although we may not be drug addicts or porn addicts or whatever, we are all repetitive sinners. And do not start telling me you're not. We are all repetitive sinners. And what do you do about that? You go in peace. You see, this is where we talk about self-examination. We all, yeah, awkward, um, yeah, um, yeah, but go in peace. And this is the profoundest answer that Elisha could have given, go in peace. Not yes, not no, because as I say, both of those answers are impossible to live by. If it was, yes, it's okay. Well, okay, so fine, that sin's great. Sin's fine, yeah, God, God will look the other way. That's fine, aren't you? No, that's not the answer. And what, can God forgive me for this you know, sin I'm going to do in advance? Well, if you just say, uh, no, he won't, well then. So God is for the perfect. God is for the steel-willed. God is for those who've got it all together. So then God is the God of actually nobody. No, that's not an answer. So this answer, go in peace, is absolutely profound. Go in peace. Yes, you are imperfect. Yes, you, you, you could do better, man. And yeah, you know, you, you may get there as it goes on. But for now, you can live every moment in peace with God. And how much truer is that for us? We can live in peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have received the atonement, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And no wonder he asks us to remember that. Well, look, let's do what Paul says. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let's just have a moment to do it. Okay, so then the bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Mike Flaherty, are you, uh, are you able to get on the audio okay and uh, pray for the bread? Uh, we can't hear you. No, can't hear you. You're unmuted, but there uh, must be something with your mic.
no problem. Okay, um, who have we got? Um, John, uh, John Alderson, would you like to give thanks for the, um, for the prayer? No problem, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the ministry that we've received today. Thank you, Lord, for that uh, real encouragement, Lord, that uh, we can be forgiven of our sins. But Lord, you are also a God who deals with us where we are. And the fact is, in a, in a group of Christians, there's always going to be some who are more mature and whose expectation um, of them you will have will be greater. But Lord, there are going to be others who are on the milk of the word or even have not even got converted yet, but just having a look and Lord, you're prepared to, to wink at their ignorance and to, Lord, deal with them. And, Lord, we thank you that you've done that with all of us in the past, even prior to our baptism, prior to when we even knew you, Lord. And it's awesome to know that you predestined us from the foundation of the world. And as we read in, in Romans, Lord, you've not only done that, but you've um, glorified us, Lord. And that's a, a present tense, Lord. In your mind, as long as we do our part and remain faithful to the end, then, Lord, you will glorify us. So we look forward to that. But we also know, as your word says, that before honour comes humility. And we've been ministered to today just to be reminded. And, and it really is a great encouragement um, to be reminded that as we go through life and as we get older and ultimately die, well, that is your purpose, just to bring us down so that you can raise us up, Lord. And if we have faith, that is a given. So, Father, we come before you, Lord, with really joyful hearts, with peaceful hearts, knowing that, Lord, this life's just a probation. It, it doesn't really count for much. So may we truly bank that. May we truly emphasize that in our lives. And, Lord, as we eat this bread, we're so thankful to you, Lord Jesus, that um, you went all the way, that you were fully obedient. And what a great high priest we have to go to, who understands the feeling of our infirmities, and is able to succor us in all of our times of need. So, Lord Jesus, we give you the glory. It's a glory, Lord, that your Father has given you, and it's a glory that the whole world shall see one day. So we thank you in, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So then, the uh, bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the cup represents his blood through his sacrifice we now have peace with god and it's a case of you know go in peace with all your misunderstandings with all your sin with all your lower level response but go in peace let's give thanks for it uh dan Mui, would you be able to give thanks for the cup or are you you're driving somewhere yeah. <clears throat> okay. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, we are so thankful and so happy to be together in the name of your son, Jesus, enjoying the fruits of his labor by sharing a wonderful relationship with you, our Father, and having your spirit helping us and guiding us in your ways and giving us the hope of your kingdom in the near future. All these, Father, are made possible by him through his perfect sacrifice. Father, we're taking this cup, symbolizing his blood, so rich and so overflowing with blessings. We remember how frail we are and how we desperately in need of your saving grace. But thank you, Father, for providing us the way truth and life in your son and it helps us to change our course of life from condemnation to full blessings in our Lord. Please give us the humble attitude to embrace your undeserved kindness and may we never never to take it for granted or having a sense of entitlement but truly appreciate your mercy and grace in him and your faithfulness in your word. Help us to live our life 
full in him and may our heart be content in him for all that he is and all that he's done for your glory in jesus name amen amen so we take the cup the symbol of the lord's life blood and our peace with god Well, shall we just uh, close down with uh, with a prayer before we uh, start chatting amongst ourselves? Um, Arash, would you like to um, would you like to give us a, a brief prayer? Heavenly Father, just I would like to thank you for today for our community that we had for your word for wisdoms and the way you're talking about the baptism give us the new visions please change us change us you said god said in genesis that made us in a face of himself just i would like to act like one of those that we would like change something very very similar to the creature that god would like Thanks for the inheritance that we have. Accept us as a children by the blood and the bread of his son. And thank you for every day that give us the vision to see, to see what he done on the cross for us and never forget the blood of Jesus Christ. Accept the peace through the Christ. And thank you for today, for community and coming in, which is so very important for me. I, this is, I get the, enough energy for the whole week. And Duncan, just God bless you for your safety, what you've done in Ukraine and all your ministry to the wards. Please give us all the community, what they need, especially I feel the feel, the asylum seeker, everybody, and continue to have in faith because having faith in difficulty is more important and give you peace. And thank you for the word of God that we heard today. In the name of mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-